Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the War for Badab. On this, the eve of the great counter-offensive, when Cartago and their fresh allies, the Firehawks, finally take the war properly to the secessionist swine to put the tyrant and his lapdogs in their place. Or, at the very least, that is what the propaganda will say. In all due reality, the strike against Iblis was, in many ways, a action taken out of frustration and anger. The Agri world was not a vital strategic objective, it was not a pivotal battlefield, but it was poorly defended, at least by the standards of the Secessionists mini-empire in the Autonomous Zone. Under any other circumstances, that fact alone would never have been enough to launch an operation on the scale currently being planned by Tarnith Koenig and the Firehawks chapter master Stebor Lazarek. The poor bastards who lived on Iblis had no way of knowing or expecting that their little green world would become the outlet for such a considerable quantity of Firehawks frustration. But as we have already more than amply demonstrated in last week's video, the Firehawks view words like self-control and restraint as some of the filthiest pieces of language ever introduced into the God Emperor's otherwise great and all-encomposing lexicon. And their patience, already observed in many cases to be shorter than the average weevil's penis, was well and truly at its end. This fact can perhaps be best exemplified by the battle plan as it stands right now before the beginning of its execution. Iblis, located here, is to be the target of the Firehawk's full chapter strength, along with some supporting elements of Battlefleet Cartago. The Firehawks and the supporting elements would set out from the Sagan sector, just north of Cartago sector. And some of you may remember all the way back to the first episode, and remember Sagan as one of the primary pillar worlds and sectors of the old autonomous zone. Indeed, Sagan is by many considered to be the gateway to the entire autonomous zone itself, as it is the area in possession of by far the most stable warp routes, and also the location of one of the largest and most centralized astronomical relays in the entire border area, allowing shipping to communicate and get its bearing far more effectively than virtually any other area that they are going to be traveling into from there on out and it is also often used as a beacon for a return voyage as well, when the light of the Astronomicon may be otherwise uh, hidden or obstructed by certain other entities lurking in the zone. Furthermore, Sagan was also a massive shipyard, with both the capabilities of repairing and resupplying huge fleets. The Firehawks had operated out of Sagan previously on various operations in the surrounding area. Battlefleet Cartago as well, of course, had it as one of its primary bases and often the start of its escort missions. The huge wealth of the Arsonoma Zone used to flow into Sagan, into massive tithe fortresses, and then in turn be taken deeper into Cartago and then distributed across the rest of the Imperium. These lanes were of course no longer in use, but Tarnit Koenig had squirreled away considerable resources on Sagan just in case she needed them. Raw resources, of course, are always very flexible. A great quantity of them had in fact already been converted to arms and armor to equip the growing Cartagen militia forces. He was slowly but surely turning into practically a regular army. An additional reason to keep a hold of a lot of resources and the back hand was, of course, in case the Assayer General needed a little bit of… greasing to make sure that he was amicable to any further overtures made by the Lady Tarnith, of course. 
but this operation was to push the logistical capabilities of Sagan to its absolute limits. Not only would the Firehawks head towards Iblis, but several Cartago fleets would also launch themselves into the Autonomous Zone. Stibor Lazarek thought that this was a part of a diversionary maneuver that Tarnith Koenig had agreed to carry out. Several fleets would draw attention away from the main thrust, and ensure that the Astral Claws and Lamenters would have something else to deal with rather than the Firehawks, ensuring a one chapter versus one chapter show off at Iblis. But. Tanith Koenig had a somewhat different opinion. Oh, she told Stebor Lazarek that this was to be the case, obviously, but in reality she was more interested in striking out against select positions within the Autonomous Zone, positions where she knew vast stockpiles of tithe were usually stored up. Because, of course, the astronomic quantities of supplies usually expected to flow out of the Autonomous Zone had to be stored up in several secure locations, just simply because there wasn't enough logistical capacity to bring it all to Sagan simultaneously. Even if it was possible, again, the Sagan shipyards simply could not have accepted it all. As we mentioned in the last episode, Koenig hoped to raid these depots for enough to keep the Yesaya General happy for the foreseeable future. But there was no reason to inform the Firehawks of this. After all, she reasoned, these attacks would achieve the primary purpose that the Firehawks wanted, a distraction. Now, the fact that the targets she mentioned in private and the targets she mentioned to the Firehawks differed ever so slightly, well... <laughs> what possible problems could arise from such, um... selective communication? <laughs> Well, anywho, why was the Firehawks intending to strike out at Iblis then? There must be some further justification beyond simple frustration, right? Well, first and foremost, <laughs> must there? Must there really? If you think that, I haven't done a good enough job of describing just how short-tempered the Firehawks are, but of course, there was an official rationale. And in all due fairness, it was not a poor one. With the Cartagen fleet striking out to distract the Astral Claws and Lamenters, the Firehawks should have a clear run at Iblis. This was a simple plan, send out some decoys and strike straight towards the target, but simplicity was necessary in this case. The Mantis Warriors had proved irritatingly adept at getting in the Firehawks' way each and every time they had tried to make it through the Endemian Cluster so far. This opening towards Iblis was not going to remain for very long. And at the end of the day, simplicity is by no stretch of the imagination always a weakness. A bold yet effective plan carried out with confidence can be far more effective than even the lengthiest and most detailed of schemes. Now previously, of course, the Firehawks had declined any outright fleet engagement with the Mantis Warriors, realizing that a single chapter versus another single chapter in a void engagement would almost certainly end with whatever side emerging victorious doing so nearly as battered, bruised and crippled as the defeated side. This, as again we discussed last time, would not really help Cartago out all that much, as even if the Firehawks were able to trade one chapter for one of the Warder's chapters, all that would really do is leave Cartago without Space Marine allies facing down the two remaining, now very, very angry, Warder's chapters and an ideal situation. But Stable Lazarek thought that with Iblis, he would be able to choose the battlefield. Previously, the main concern had been that the Mantis Warriors were always the ones choosing the ground. They could have set up ambushes, they could have reserves and reinforcements lurking in wait. 
But if the Firehawks were the ones initiating, they could use the might of the Raptorus Rex Star Fortress as an undeniable spearhead to initiate and break the Mantis Warriors fleet, who would undoubtedly be rushing, presumably even piecemeal, to the defense of Iblis, the one chink in their armor allowing the Fire Warriors to systematically annihilate the Mantis Warriors chapter with minimal damage to their own fighting forces. It was exactly the kind of engagement that Stibor Lazarek had been looking for all this time. And so, with the plans laid, all that remained then was the preparations. The Firehawks fleet and the fleets of Cartago were all expected to be gone for a significant portion of time, and also to engage in heavy fighting whilst doing so. The Cigar Naval Yard was worked to the bone day and night to meet the Firehawks' strict scheduling, to ensure that they could move before the opening was closed. It did push Sagan to the very brink of its capacity, but after heroic efforts, all the logistical needs of the Cartagen distraction fleet and the Firehawks were met in a remarkably timely manner. And so, with a great deal of pomp and ceremony, the combined allied fleets finally slipped out of the Sagan system and into the Secessionist Autonomous Zone to finally teach Huron and his rebels a lesson they would not soon forget. It would still take the Firehawks fleet quite some time to travel through the warp all the way to Iblis, but this was viewed as, if anything, an advantage for the Cartagen Firehawks Alliance, as it would give the decoy fleets plenty of time to draw away Astral Claws and Lamenter's reinforcements, possibly even some of the Mantis Warriors as well. It had been speculated amongst the Cartagen and Firehawk leadership that maybe the Warders had simply divided the responsibility for certain sectors of their new little mini-empire, and would probably not be leaving these areas unless directly requested to or threatened in some way. But. This information was really only based on the fact that if they went over here, they were more likely to run into Mantis Warriors, and if they went over there, they'd be more likely to run into Lamentis. They didn't really have a clear view of the deployment of the Warders, or whether or not that was permanent, so all possibilities were still open. I'm sure the Firehawks would have loved to receive at least some reports from the various decoy fleets before arriving in the Iblis system to give them a little bit of forewarning of what they may or may not be facing, but communication within the Autonomous Zone was, well, challenging, even when you were trying to communicate with entire systems or planets, never mind a fleet travelling in the warp whilst trying to stay as stealthy as such a mode of travel allows. The initial signs, though, were quite promising. When the lead elements of the Firehawks flotilla entered the outskirts of the Iblis system, they could report back that they detected no ident signatures related to the Mantis Warriors chapter. No strike cruisers, no battle barges, and no significant tyrant, guard, or imperial navy equivalent presence either. Those handful of contacts that were identified as warships were all system defense barges. If I were to give you a rough equivalent for reference with our own world, a PDF system defense barge would be a river patrol boat. Plentiful danger to the occasional smuggler or minor pirate band, absolutely, but no threat whatsoever, of course, to a real warship. A fact immediately and unmistakably recognized by the crews of those PDF vessels, as they immediately lit their real space engines in an attempt to get out of the way of the Firehawks fleet as swiftly as possible. I mean, 
It's all well and good saying that you would stand in the face of adversity to protect your home world and all, but um, when you actually find yourself facing down a rampaging T-Rex with a ferocious hate boner for your house in particular, armed only with a slingshot filled with gummy bears, such lofty ideals as self-sacrifice in the name of home and heart, I think you will find tend to go rather flaccid rather rapidly. And with nothing to impede their progress, the Firehawks fleet immediately set course for the planet of Iblis itself. The expected resistance was nothing to be overly worried about. Iblis was just an agri world after all, and one on the fringes of the Endymion Cluster as well, with very little real strategic value. Worst case scenario, the Firehawks expected to encounter mixed PDF forces, little more than local militia in all due reality. They did, however, still wish to carry out a landing operation on the planet. It is unclear whether or not they were in possession of Exterminator's grade weaponry, though considering later events it seems unlikely. The landings on Iblis were clearly also a part of a grander scheme. They did not wish to take the planet, or hold it, or simply to burn the crops because they would deny the secessionists food. They were doing this as acts essentially of wanton vandalism and destruction. Their goal was to make the civilian populace suffer, and so force the Mantis warrior's hands. Now at first blush, it may seem rather risque to rely upon your enemy's honour and humanity to bring them to battle, but this was essentially a war between loyalist forces, and the Mantis Warriors had demonstrated repeatedly that they were more than willing to put themselves in between the Firehawks and civilian targets. <laughs> and the Firehawks, of course. <laughs> well. If after all this you still thought they had some form of scruples, well... <laughs> no. Just... <laughs> just no. And to be fair, that is exactly what the Space Marines are. I rag an awful lot on the poor Firehawks here occasionally, but... Uh, what are the Space Marines supposed to be, if not belligerent mass-murdering religious zealots? with but one goal in mind, the extermination of their foes. And in such a pursuit, silly, fluffy concepts as scruples and morality are nothing more than worthless baggage. And the plan appeared to be working, as whilst the Firehawk fleet was closing in on Iblis, Two contacts at the edge of the system were detected by long-range auger arrays, and swiftly identified as a pair of Mantis Warriors strike cruisers. Just like Stibor Lazarek had foretold, their honour and humanity had brought them to the battlefield. Now all that remained was to turn it into a slaughtering ground for the secessionists. But whilst honour had ensured the Mantis Warriors' arrival, they were not quite so honourable, or stupid, depending upon your point of view, as to simply throw themselves upon the guns of the Raptorus Rex. Instead, the Mantis Warriors approached very carefully, making sure to stay well out of range of the Star Fortress weapon batteries. And so the Firehawks began deploying Space Marines onto the surface of Iblis. This was not necessary. Their fleet could have bombarded any major population centre with ease. The Raptorus Rex alone would have been more than enough to scorch the entire continents with his lance batteries. But that was also the exact reason why the Mantis Warriors were keeping their distance. Any overt move on the fleet would be nothing more than object suicide. If the Firehawks were on the planet, however, that might make the Mantis Warriors feel like they had just about enough chance to have to risk it. 
to honor their obligations to the people of Iblis. And sure enough, the strike cruisers began approaching. Carefully, cautiously, very skeptically, sure, but the Firehawks made no moves to intercept them. That would defeat the point, after all, and simply allowed the Mantis Warriors to put the planet in between themselves and the Firehawks' fleet. Very soon, the Hawks would have more interesting prey than scattered PDF and farmers to fight. And it didn't take long before engagements were reported by the landing forces. The green clad sons of Jagatai Khan were more than living up to their lineage, having moved swiftly to begin engaging the Firehawks in several small scale skirmishes scattered across the planet. This was exactly what Steepor Lazaruk had wanted, and further reports of ships appearing at the edges of the system were seen as confirmation that the Mantis warriors would be feeding themselves into the battlefield piecemeal, just as expected. Steepor reasoned that if he ever wanted to, he could end the ground war with the flip of the switch by deploying the Raptorus Rex's weaponry to end any engagement that did not seem to be going in his favor. Ideally, of course, he would prefer to bleed the Mantis Warriors slow, personal-like, blade to blade, bolter to bolter. They had proven far too annoying to simply be obliterated from orbit, an unpersonal death. Not the style of the Firehawks at all, that. Now, unfortunately, we know relatively little about the combat that took place on Iblis, but I imagine that as soon as his trap appeared to be closing, Stebo Lazarek would have gotten on the first Thunderhawk or drop pod available and joined in the fighting. Particularly as the Mantis Warriors were proving to be their usual infuriating selves, um, launching swift yet light strikes against the Firehawks. A squad engaged in burning the countryside somewhere would suddenly find itself the target of a fusillade of bolter rounds. Reacting with inhuman speed and precision, the Firehawks would scatter and return fire immediately. By the time they had gotten reorganized, a matter of mere seconds for Adeptus Astartes laid down their own covering fire and begun to flank the opposition, the firing would cease as suddenly as it had begun. And no matter how swiftly the Firehawks rushed to the position they had been fired upon from, all they would find was a smattering of expended bolter shells scattered on the ground and the tracks of a rhino leading off into the distance. In every one or two out of ten of these engagements, a Firehawk would suddenly be pitched off his feet, a fist-sized hole blasted through his armor. And in every one or two out of twenty engagements, they would close upon the ambush point and find hyper-oxygenated Astartes' blood dappled on the ground, or possibly the fragments of blasted open power armor. Chapter Master Lazarek may very well have been planning on bleeding the Mantis Warriors to death, but this was going to be far too slow of a rate of exsanguination. Even those Astartes who were hit were far more likely to be merely wounded than outright killed. At the lengthy engagement ranges, apparently favoured by the Mantis Warriors, Astartes' power armour would prove quite effective even against bolter rounds, and anything short of a hit directly to the head would be likely to result in little more than a week or two in the infirmary. And even in the case of a straight-up headshot, unlike what Black Library with their novel covers might tell you, most Space Marines do in fact choose to wear their helmets. Which, if nothing else, gives the unfortunate Space Marine the chance of being a WIA instead of a good old KIA. And whilst normally, of course, low casualty numbers would be a good thing, this was not boding well for the Firehawks. They were being swept up in the Mantis Warriors style of fighting, hit and run ambuscades without deeply committing to anything. 
This was the textbook example on how a much smaller force could hold a much larger one at bay for days, weeks, and possibly months. Meanwhile, the Firehawks were very much so aware that they were deep in enemy territory here and needed to resolve the conflict sooner rather than later. I can quite vividly imagine Lazarek's ever more frustrated countenance as that thought starts boring its way into his mind as well. Rushing around Iblis trying desperately again and again to get a good engagement with the Mantis Warriors, with his frustration rising at each and every failure, as the problems in the void repeated themselves on the surface. The Mantis Warriors were there, but there was no good way to actually get to grips with them. But then, a strange suspicion started to sliver its way into Stibor Lazarek's otherwise quite clouded mind. Make no mistake, he might have had quite a temper on him, but he was not a chapter master for nothing, and soon he began to notice irregularities. Firehawks combat squads were reporting contact more and more frequently. A squad would be fired upon, they would rapidly rush to the ambush position, only to more often not find nothing there, but then, moments thereafter, they would be fired at again from a completely different direction. To begin with, the report simply just flowed into one another. Presumably, the squad had been engaged again. So, what of it? It was happening all over the planet. The Firehawks were engaged in a continuous rolling skirmish against an unknown number of Mantis Warriors. But hold on a moment. Unknown number. That's where the catch was. Stibor Lazarek had only received reports of two Mantis Warrior strike cruisers approaching from out of system, and two Iblis. Two cruisers. That could not possibly be more than two, maybe three hundred Mantis Warriors. And yet, the majority of his entire chapter was currently engaged in rolling skirmishes. Now the green armored sons of the Khan were undoubtedly skilled at rapid relocation, but this was simply not possible. Barking out a rapid string of orders, Stibor Lazarek immediately changed the priorities of all Firehawks on Iblis. They were no longer to try and rush the Mantis Warriors to catch them out in close quarters combat and annihilate them. Instead, they should seek and maintain the engagement via long-range bolter fire. Soon thereafter, it was clear that the Mantis Warriors were hesitant about drawing away from a ranged engagement. That was another piece of the puzzle slotting into place in Stibor Lazarek's mind. Quickly double-checking, he realized that his own troops had been scattered across a larger and larger area, each Mantis Warrior's ambush drawing the squads further and further apart. Quickly reacting and reorganizing his troops in more centralized areas, he swiftly realized too that the engagement rate was increasing. The squads were being ambushed from multiple locations in further attempts to draw them apart. Reining in his natural reaction to charge into the gunfire, Lazarek continued to pull his own troops into tighter and tighter pockets until it was clear that they were taking overwhelming fire. Now, each squad was being attacked from two or three locations simultaneously, and the larger groupings were seemingly near surrounded. The only possible explanation to this was that there were no two or three hundred Mantis Warriors on the planet, that entire chapter was here. Oh, upon realizing this, Stibor Lazarek must have had a very special curse indeed uh, towards the Mantis Warrior's own chapter master, Khoisan Neo Terra, as he realized he had been tricked. He had not surprised the Mantis Warriors, this was not an unexpected gap in their defensive line, it was a trap. He immediately contacted the Raptorus Rex in orbit and demanded firing solutions, only to be informed by the panicked voice of the fleet captains that ships had emerged in ever larger quantities. They had tried to get contact with the Firehawks chapter master to report this, but he had been too absorbed in the combat. 
not only Mantis Warriors battle barges and strike cruisers, but Imperial Navy equivalent vessels as well, including one ship that had emerged at the very edges of the system and then immediately fired at a ridiculous range towards the Raptorus Rex. The projectile had gone wide by a considerable margin, but by that, the captain had surmised that the secessionist had just fired a Nova cannon weapon against the Star Fortress. One of the very few guns in the entirety of the galaxy that could threaten the Rex. And there it was. <laughs> Coincidence? No, I don't think so. Lazarek immediately called for a Thunderhawk to come and fetch him back up to the Raptorus Rex, where he could get a better idea of the situation. As soon as he did arrive, he could confirm the panicked reports of his captains. Multiple vessels had indeed arrived in system. They were closing in on the Firehawk's fleet from all sides, and the Cartago escort vessels had already mostly been destroyed. And the energy readings did not lie either. It was a Nova cannon that had fired upon the Raptorus Rex. The only vessel capable of using such a weapon within the entirety of the Maelstrom Zone was the Mars-class battlecruiser Sacred Tetrarch, one of the heaviest vessels boasted by the Maelstrom Squadron. If there had been any doubts as to the loyalties of the Imperial Navy elements left within the Autonomous Zone, they were now well and truly settled. But Misery, as always, loves company. And this was not the only bad news that awaited Stebo and Lazarek on his Star Fortress, far from it. Reports had arrived from the Sagan Naval Yards. The first part of it was boring if peculiar reading. The Carthagen expeditionary fleets that were meant to act as decoys for the Firehawk assault had ran into stiff opposition all across their targeting sectors, but not from the Lamenters nor from the Astral Claws. They had encountered Maelstrom Squadron forces, Imperial Navy equivalents, and Tyrant's Legion guards on all of the planets they had attempted to assault. But no mention of any Astartes opposition. The reason for that became blindingly obvious in the next report, which urged the Firehawks to return immediately because Sagan itself was under assault by a mass combined force of Astral Claws and Lamenters. Whoops. <laughs> You have to laugh, because the only other option would be to cry. The entire offensive operation had been presented by the Firehawks and accepted by the Carthagen Lords as a way to finally strike out at something, anything within the secessionists grasp out of de facto desperation and a drive to get some kind of a point up on the board, a morale-boosting victory if nothing else, and Luft Huron had read them like an open book. He hadn't known precisely where they would strike, but he had known they would have to strike somewhere. After which it was all merely just a process of elimination, and reading the warp wakes emerging out of the Sagar naval yards. The Mantis Warriors were put in place to slow and parry the main thrust of the Firehawks, which was expected to be launched against the Mantis Warriors if for no other reason than because they had annoyed them the most. And the Cartagen attacks, once again, Battlefleet Cartago was a threat, absolutely so, but it was a void-born threat. The Tyrant's Legion would be more than enough to parry any large-scale land operations which they would have to carry out if they wanted to inflict any real damage upon the secessionists. 
Meanwhile, any operation of such scale would undoubtedly be launched from one place and one place only. The gateway to the secessionists' domain, the Sagan Navally Hearts, leaving them wide open and vulnerable to a riposte. Tanith Koenig had believed the myth, the tales, and the stories of the space marines, the guard emperors, avenging angels, and their perfection to be nothing more than hyperbolic statements fed to a unquestioning mass for propaganda purposes. But as ever bleaker report piled upon report coming out of the Sagan Naval Yard, perhaps she finally began to believe them. Space Marine battle barges were hammering through Cartago fleet elements left as guards. Defense platforms and orbital defense silos were ruptured and broken after Adeptus Astartes' assault teams had scoured them clean of opposition in mere hours. And the Titanic tithe fortresses on Sagan itself, designed to resist any pilot fleet, no matter the size, for an indeterminate amount of time, were all under siege. Drop pods had already hammered into them, and hulking lamentous terminators were mercilessly massacring the Cartagen defenders. An objective that should have taken months, if not years, to secure was falling in hours. And with it, the Firehawks retreat path as well. The Sagan system was not the only entrance and exit from the now secessionist autonomous zone, of course. But it was by far the most stable and secure. Any other route would be circuitous and hazardous in the extreme. But even worrying about retreat would be putting the cart before the horse right now, as the Firehawks were still heavily engaged with the Mantis Warriors on Iblis, even as their own fleet was mere moments away from receiving attacks from all quarters by approaching Maelstrom squadrons and Mantis Warriors vessels. This was no time to be hanging around, and Stibor Lazarek immediately ordered all Firehawk's forces to disengage and flee Iblis as quickly as possible. And for once, it was the Mantis Warriors and Khoisan Neoterra who were caught on the back foot. They had perhaps not expected the Firehawks to react so quickly and so decisively. Just like the Firehawks had underestimated the Mantis Warriors' capabilities for defense, the Mantis Warriors had perhaps started to view the Firehawks as nothing more than blood-maddened berserkers charging in whatever direction they were being shot at at the moment. But these were still Adeptus Astartes. For all their bellicose nature, for all their aggression, they are still one of the finest and most disciplined fighting forces in the entirety of the Imperium. And when their master tells them to retreat, they do so with the speed and precision that truly exemplifies the God Emperor's finest warriors. And as the sons of the Khan rushed to pursue, Stibor Lazarek played his Joker, his Trump card. He ordered the Raptorus Rex to fire, not on the encroaching fleet, but on Iblis itself. Massive lance batteries and bombardment cannons began tearing, gouging, and ripping the surface of Iblis apart. Momentarily taken aback, stunned almost by this seemingly absurd and reckless course of action, Klingsan Neoterra hesitated. The Firehawks were as likely to annihilate their own men on the surface as to strike the Mantis Warriors with this, as they were right up alongside the Firehawks. Stibor Lazarek must have had absolute faith in the skills of his gunners to not hit his own men even whilst firing from orbit. Even during the best of conditions, hitting even a city-sized target might be the best that gunners can expect. 
and yet here, the Raptorus Rex was firing its weaponry directly down into an active war zone, whilst the sacred Tetrarch was firing its Nova Cannon towards the Star Fortress. But whether it be a reckless insanity or faith well rewarded, it worked. The Mantis Warriors would not march straight in to the bombardment of the Raptorus Rex. Khoisan Neotar did not trust the Firehawk Gunners quite as much as their chapter master did, and immediately ordered his men to disengage at top speed, make for their landing sites and blast off in Thunderhawks to get out of the way. Whilst the Firehawks also moved away without losing so much as a single Battle Brother to what was, for all intents and purposes, a point blank range artillery bombardment. But it still wasn't quite over. Even with the forces from the surface recovered, the Firehawks fleet still had to find a way out of the system, and out of the way of the ever-closing dragnet of Maelstrom Squadron ships and Mantis Warriors vessels. Then, of course, there was also the Sacred Tetrarch to worry about and its Nova Cannon, a weapon that absolutely could and would end up doing serious damage to the Raptorus Rex. But in this, the decisive actions taken by Stebor Lazarek had once again proven to be swifter and more effective than the enemy may have realized. It could be because the Mantis Warriors themselves had rushed to Iblis as quickly as they could once they figured out what the Fire Warriors was targeting. But their maneuvers to surround the fleet were not yet finished. The Sacred Tetrarch and her escort were rushing to close the gap as quickly as possible, but they were outpacing the Mantis Warriors who had remained at long range, presumably in an effort to fool the Firehawks into thinking that they would not dedicate themselves outright, and that they were no true threat to the Firehawks fleet to keep them in orbit. But now the Firehawks were doing the exact opposite. One final instruction was given to the gunnery crew of the Raptorus Rex. It was to unleash one final full barrage against Iblis. No precision strike, no surgeon's approach. This simply one last petulant blow to inflict as much damage as possible. Hundreds of kilometers of farmland, of settlements, of villages, and townships were annihilated and razed in the vengeful fury of the Star Fortress guns as the Mantis Warriors in their Thunderhawks raised as swiftly as possible to keep out of the way of the beams of searing energy carving deep grooves into the planet. With its final act of brutish petty vengeance completed, the Behemoth Star Fortress turned ponderously and lit all engines. Heading for the outer edges of the system, it would lead the Firehawks fleet out of the rapidly encircling enemy vessels. What followed was presumably hours of vicious ship-to-ship -ship fighting, with the Firehawks shedding the last of their Cartagon escorts in a bid to escape faster before the surround could be completed. All we really know is that the Raptorus Rex moved ahead, like an unbreakable shield absorbing all the punishment the secessionists could pour into her. The Sacred Tetrarch, her thrusters burning in reverse, fired shot after shot after shot, undoubtedly blasting entire chunks out of the massive Firehawks relic ship with every hit. But it simply wasn't enough. The Rex was a void-born continent. Entire segments could be hauled to the void or blasted clean off the superstructure and it would not stop her. Her advance was implacable and the Sacred Tetrarch was lost with all hands. Crushed, battered, sliced and annihilated by massed weapon batteries. A futile end, perhaps but one of sufficient bravery for even the Hawks, surely, to have taken notice. 
After the last light of the last lance beam had faded away into the galactic darkness, all that remained was to take stock. The Firehawks refused to speak of the campaign against Iblis. It is a matter of no concern to any outsiders. The secessionist reports have all been burned and put to the obliteration edict. No solid record of any losses have ever emerged for this battle. What we do know is that the Firehawks shed all of their escorting elements. Every ship of Battlefleet Cartago that followed the Firehawks to Iblis stayed at Iblis. The Firehawks themselves must have suffered considerable casualties both on the planet and in the retreat. With the Raptorus Rex having led the breakout against a Nova cannon, she herself must have been severely wounded many, many times over, but clearly not enough to stop her from entering the warp and exiting the system. This would be but the beginning, however, of the Firehawks' trials, because by far the greater story in all of this is the surprise attack upon the Sagan naval yards. With the seizure of these crucial facilities and even more importantly, the vital stable warp lanes, the Firehawks fleet was trapped on the wrong side of secessionist space, alongside the majority of Battlefleet Cartago as well. Only the odd occasional dregs of Battlefleet Cartago would ever again emerge from the secessionist zone, whereas the Firehawks would now be forced into a several months long period of continuous harassment and defensive battles. The fleet desperately seeking some way to return back to Cartago without having to go through the Sagan sector, which would swiftly be fortified by the Astral Claws and the Lamenters. The Firehawks were in no shape now to take on a combined fleet of those chapters, and so it would seek out any other stable warp route with which to return, whilst constantly being under attack by the Mantis Warriors nipping at their heels, always staying just out of range of a decisive engagement, but always leaving the Firehawks vessels with brand new scars and blasted away strips of armor plating, inflicting light but constant casualties. It appeared as if the Mantis Warriors had gained an entirely new respect for the Firehawks. One might argue that Khoisan Neoterra could have closed in on the Firehawks fleet and annihilated it, or at the very least decimated it to such a point where it no longer mattered. But to do so, he would once again have to brave the guns of the Raptorus Rex. And after the loss of the Sacred Tetrarch, the only Mars-class Nova cannon-armed vessel within the secessionist fleet, it seems quite reasonable for Neo Terra to adopt a more defensive wait-and-see approach. There is also an argument to be made that Luft Huron, after having scored a massive victory, might want to see if peace talks could possibly be generated out of this. Surely, the Firehawks could not be in a state to continue the war now, and after losing a massive portion of her fleet, surely Tarnit Koenig as well would finally see reason and call for talks. And regardless of the actions of his opposition, Huron himself also needed time. He had expanded his secessionist empire very rapidly with the seizure of Sagan, an area that needed fortification, and it needed it very, very, very quickly. He knew that at the moment at least he was not at war with the Imperium, but after all the blood that had been spilled between Astartes, well, 
Lefthodon was about to make use of the bonds between Space Marine Brothers to call another chapter into the war, and undoubtedly he must have suspected that his enemies might now try to do the same thing. This had absolutely been a victory for the secessionists, a near crushing one as well, but only time will tell how effective the seizure of Sagan has truly been. Until next time, I have been Arch, thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Until then, have a good day.